how, how is our band this morning? Oh my goodness. Let's give Wes and the crew another round of applause. Awesome. Well, Scott, he said my name a couple of times in the announcement. I'm Richie Goad. I'm the minister of discipleship here at Catalyst Church. And when people hear that I'm the minister of discipleship, sometimes that raises questions. What exactly does a minister of discipleship do? Well, I'll share with you some of my responsibilities as I'm on staff here at Catalyst Church. A uh, big responsibility that I have is I overlook our connection group ministry. And we are currently on a break until the fall, but keep your eyes and ears open for locations, connection group leaders for the fall, because we truly believe that our connection groups are the lifeblood of our ministry here at Catalyst Church. We are relational discipleship. And talking about a church that does relational discipleship, I also look over our discipleship groups that we have going on. Uh, we have men's discipleship groups. We have women's discipleship groups. And if you are interested in getting connected in discipleship, I would love to get with you and talk with you about that. But another part of my responsibilities here at Catalyst Church is I overlook the student ministry. That is grades 6 through 12. I overlook our youth group. And I feel like as the guy, the student minister, who looks over our middle school and high schoolers, I feel like I have this, this heavy obligation to help bridge the gap between student and parent. To bridge the gap between the younger generation and an older generation. And if that's cool with you this morning, do you think we could do a little activity to maybe awkwardly help bridge the gap between the younger generation and older generation. Does that sound good with y'all? Okay, awesome. So we're going to play a game together this morning, and it's called Gen Z Lingo. All right? So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to pop up on the screen a word that Gen Zers use, and I want y'all to just yell out to me what you believe that word means. Okay? Y'all got it? Y'all got the rules? All right. So let's, uh, let's, do, let's do word number one. No cap. Yeah, no cap. No lie, right? Right, no lie. I'm not lying. That worship set this morning was really good. No cap, right? Okay, I gave it my best shot. Here's the next one. Bougie. I like this one because I like the way it, it flows off my tongue. All right? Fancy, right? Okay. Bougie, me being fancy, right? Awesome. All right, bussin'. I like, now this word, I like to pop in around the office, Wes and I do, and it drives the rest of the staff crazy sometimes. Incredible. So bussin', incredible, amazing. Something to say when something is really good. I heard really good here in the corner. That's good. Now, here is our last Gen Z word, Gen Z phrase that I want us to look at. It's this phrase, living rent-free. I got that living rent-free, bro. Did I use that right, high schoolers? Okay, all right. All right. So living rent-free. Y'all know what that is? No worries. Uh, kind of. Living rent-free in your mind. Okay, let's see what this word means. It means obsessively thinking about someone or something. Someone, something is just living rent-free in your mind, high schoolers, middle schoolers, y'all can pick on me about that later, all right? So this idea of living rent-free, I, let me give you an example of this. I see this in athletics often, okay? Uh, for me, I'm a really, really big college football fan, and particularly, I love the Virginia Tech Hokies, right? I love Virginia Tech. I, I follow them religiously. I love to look at their stats, and over the years, they have a pretty solid record against their rival, the University of Virginia Cavaliers. They just haven't won a whole lot of football games lately. And as a guy who's on Twitter, I look through and scroll through during the football season about what these different schools are saying. And every week, regardless of the opponent, the University of Virginia's Twitter account puts something in there about how they want so badly to beat the Virginia Tech Hokies. Okay, they, they are destined to do it. They will try to get under Virginia Tech fan skins. They'll try to do anything that they can to say, hey, we are going to win this game. And what I see as a Virginia Tech fan who's uh, whose team is controlling the series 
is that we are living rent-free in their minds. As the winning team, we control things. They live rent-free. But this morning, as you think about this idea of someone or something living rent-free in your mind, maybe it, just, maybe it goes a little bit deeper than just sports. Maybe over the years, you have developed this long list of lies, manipulative thoughts that have just become rent-free in your mind, and they are keeping you from moving forward. Maybe it's that lie, that negative thought, that you will never find happiness. Because every time something good happens to you, it's always upended by something bad, and it's just become a pattern. Maybe it's this lie that you are unlovable. You've had failed relationship after failed relationship. I'm unlovable, and that's living rent-free in your head. Maybe as a, as a kid, there was an adult in your life, and they berated you, and they told you that you were not good enough. You would never amount to anything. And as an impressionable young person, that can just carry on with you the rest of your life and live rent-free in your head. I remember when I was in fifth grade, we had a school field day, and we got to wear hats to school. And that made me really excited because you didn't usually get to wear a hat to school. And I remember I had an Oakland A's hat, green, white A on the front, yellow bill. And I'm wearing it in school, and this guy behind me, his name was Mark. I'm going to throw him under the bus this morning. His name was Mark. And he started making fun of me because when I had this hat on, <laughs> I, I had to have the snap on the very last snap because my head was so big. And it looked like the hat was going to pop off. And, and I go on it, Mark, he started making fun of me because he said I had a big head. And then that caused a domino effect throughout the rest of the class. And people started saying, hey, Richie's got a big head and making fun of me. It ruined field day. And I go home and I tell my mom, hey, everybody at school was making fun of me because they say I have a big head. And my mom says, look, son, we, when you were a baby, we had to get you tested for that. All right? <laughs> That's still living rent free, mom. But we all know what it's like, right? We all know what it's like to, to dwell on the negative thoughts, the lies that take residency in our minds. You know, sometimes the thing is we don't even notice that those lies are living rent-free until, until we are triggered. But let me say this morning that those lies, those negative thoughts that you have living rent-free in your mind, they're not of God. They're not of God. God is, he's too good, he's too loving, he's too caring. But just because God doesn't want to make you feel a certain way, he doesn't want you to feel a certain way, doesn't mean that we are not going to struggle with it. Because the reality is there is someone who wants those thoughts and those lies to take permanent residency in your mind. You know, when I look at scripture, when I think of, some of the most comforting verses that I can find that have helped me when I have those lies and thoughts living rent-free in my mind comes from Psalm 23, and I, I want to read that to you this morning. And you've probably heard of this psalm. Maybe it's familiar. I, I know I've read it to help comfort people, whether it's at funerals, uh, when someone's been sick, or at bedsides. And here is what King David has to share. He says this, that the Lord is my shepherd... I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We've all maybe heard that. We're all maybe familiar with it. But there is one verse in this text that I want us to look at that points out to me or sticks out to me this morning. And it's verse 5. King David, he says that you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. 
You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. See, God, he prepares a table before us with a meal that is far superior than any meal that we have ever had. The goodness of this table is set right in front of us in the presence of our enemies. God's care for us is present even though our enemies are still there. The enemy that is seen and the enemy that is unseen. But the question I want to ask this morning is this. How often do we make a little bit of room at the table that's been prepared for us for the enemy to sit? How often do we allow the enemy at our table and allow him to live rent-free in our minds? And I'll just share this with you this morning. This, uh, for me, the lies, the negative thoughts, the manipulative thoughts, they live rent-free in my mind, and I remember them from the past when things are going well. I'll share this with you. If you're in church leadership, we have some of our leaders in here this morning. If you're on staff at a church, you know what I'm talking about. Things are going well. Things are moving forward. Things are growing. The enemy hates that. And he's going to try to make those lies that live rent-free in your mind come out in full force. Are things going well at school? The enemy doesn't like that. Things going well in your marriage? The enemy doesn't like that. Things going well at work? The enemy is going to do anything, place any lie, thought, manipulative thing in your mind to ruin it all. You know, if you look all the way back at the very beginning, when creation, when God created the world, everything was perfect. And because it was perfect, the enemy wanted to disrupt that perfection. And here's the thing, the enemy doesn't always do it by introducing a full-fledged lie. Sometimes he, he gives information that is partly true, and it's up to us to discern whether or not to believe it. If you got your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Genesis chapter 3. It's not hard to find. You just open it up a couple of pages in. And we hopefully have an idea of what this story is all about. We read Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. And he said to the woman who was Eve, Did God really say you must not eat from uh, any tree in the garden? Well, the woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. So I, I read that and I'm like, okay. Yes, Eve, you are staying in line with the truth. But what happens when the enemy responds, especially... Uh, but look what happens when the enemy responds, especially when what the enemy has to say seems enticing. What we're going to see is Eve, she begins to make a little bit of room for the enemy to sit at the table. Verse 4, You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together, and they made coverings for themselves." So not only does the enemy try to make us believe lies and half-truths about ourselves, but he's also going to try to make us believe lies and half-truths about God. See, the enemy is quite an enticing manipulator because not everything that the enemy says is always lies. Would Adam and Eve die? Yeah, they would. Would they be like God? Be like God, knowing good and evil? Yeah, they would. They would be able to discern that now. But the question is, were they God? No, they would never be God. And we know the rest. Eve eats fruit, gives fruit to Adam. Their eyes are open. They realize they're naked. They hear the Lord coming. They hide. They're ashamed, and they are caught. What happened is that they allowed the enemy a seat at their table. And since the fall of man, for thousands upon thousands of years, these dominoes of lies, of deceit, 
of manipulation had continued to fall, placing these voices in our head that live rent-free, that try to destroy us and take us down. Here are some examples uh, to go along with what Scott shared last week of some of these lies that the enemy wants us to believe. I'll never change. I'll feel better if I sin. Here's the thing. That's not a full-fledged lie, folks, right? Because sometimes if you do sin in that moment, you might feel better, but the long-term consequences, the gospel doesn't really work. Another lie, I'm not worth much. No one loves me. No one believes in me. I deserve to be bitter. I deserve to be filled with rage. I'm a product of my past, and I cannot change my future. I'm a failure. I am my addiction. I'll always be this way. And th- See, these are examples of thoughts that the enemy wants so desperately to live rent-free in your minds. They're the fruit of what happens when we allow the enemy a seat at our table. But the question is, what do we do to change our way of thinking? How do we change what we allow to live rent-free in our minds? You know, last week, Scott, he shared with us how God has done his part. How God has done the heavy lifting for you that even when we have those times in which we believe the lies and manipulative thoughts, God still has our back. We saw the Apostle Paul's words in his letter to to the Romans that even though, even while we were still sinners, God demonstrated his love for you and I in sending his son to die for us. If that doesn't say God's done the heavy lifting, I don't know what says that. But now, how do we respond to that heavy lifting? What is our part? Well, let me suggest that what you and I have to do is to not give the enemy a seat at our table. What we have to do is capture. We have to take captive the the lies, the manipulative thoughts in our minds from the enemy and make them obedient to Christ. You must capture what is going on in your head and tell the enemy that he is not welcome at your table. We have to take hold of what Jesus truly says about us. What Jesus says about my identity, what he says about my family, what he says about my future, what he says about the church. You know, on Tuesday mornings at 7 o'clock a.m., We have a group that gets together right up here and we take these chairs and we kind of make a a oval, kind of make a a circle somewhat, and we are in our Bible reading plan of the New Testament. We just sit together, some people bring coffee, we all have our Bibles, and we just talk about something new that we saw in Scripture. We talk about what we underlined, what we highlighted, and uh, we'd love for you if you're able to be there for that Tuesdays, 7 a.m. in the morning. And this past week, we got a little bit into 2 Corinthians. And I want to share with you something that we're actually going to be looking at this upcoming week from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verses uh, 3 through 5. And listen to what the Apostle Paul says here. He says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world, but on the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Pay attention to verse 5. Paul says, We demolish arguments in every pretension that sets up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So every thought, every lie that we have living rent-free in our minds, we have to say, Is this thought true? Is this an idea that I need to entertain? Is there something I need to do? Should I welcome this thought at my table? Well, here's the thing. I want to tell you this morning that all those thoughts, those lies that you have living rent-free in your mind, you, you can capture those thoughts. You can capture those lies. But it's going to require some work on your part. We are forced to put on our big boy and big girl pants and hit it head on. It's a process. I want you to think this morning about what this process actually looks like. First, when it comes to taking captive uh, every thought and every lie, we have to recognize the lie. We, we've got to understand this. Though we have these lies that live rent-free in our minds, we also 
probably have hard truths that we have living in our mind as well that cause us to become anxious and anxiety-ridden that we just haven't done anything about. I'll tell you what has helped me out to recognize the lies that the enemy wants me to believe. Um, every Tuesday morning, us as a staff, uh, we meet for our staff, uh, staff meeting. And before our staff meeting, Scott, he will give us a prayer prompt uh, to journal on, to think about, to meditate on. And uh, what I'll do from time to time is I'll grab that journal and I'll read what I have prayed about from those prompts And what that has allowed me to do is see the lies that I have talked with God about and think about ways in which I had combated them. April 10th, 2023, I wrote an entry, and I won't get real specific about it, but just kind of generally what I said was, God, I've been living here in Greensboro for almost a year now. And I thought that that would drastically change my dating life. But nothing has, nothing has really happened. And I talked with God about that. And what, what it was is it was a mindfulness journal. And I talked to God about my concern. And then you would write God's reply. And what I thought God was replying in that moment was, Richie, you got to give yourself more credit. You got to be more open. You got to be more, more willing to actually get out there. And it turns out, a few months later, the person God wanted me to be with, someone I went to church with. It just required me to to become open and not put up these walls around myself. And that leads to another thing. Uh, Something else that's helped me realize and recognize the lies that I have living rent-free in my head is having the right people around you. People who aren't going to be afraid to let you know Areas that you've done great, but also areas you've messed up and how you can become better. Uh, Next, we have to tackle the lie. So we recognize the lie, now we tackle the lie. I can't tell you how many times over, over the years that someone has had this lie or thought in their minds that I've been talking to, been ministering with about themselves, and they simply haven't done anything about it. See, sometimes the thoughts that live rent free in our minds, they are actually true but we've allowed them to hold us back. And the thing is, they're always going to hold you back if you don't tackle them. It takes work. It takes action. Here's the thing. I use this word tackle because it's just something that makes sense to me. I love football, as I said earlier. College football is is my thing. But if you watch football for any amount of time, you will see that tackling someone at that amount of speed, especially professional football players, it's very, very difficult. The, the opponent's not just going to fall in your arms. You actually got to do something about it. It takes work. It takes effort. It takes plenty of reps in practice to be able to better make those tackles. But here's the thing. It's so much easier to brush off those lies and negative thoughts in our heads under the rug. Sometimes we forget about those thoughts from time to time, but then they pop up on us out of nowhere. I don't know what that looks like for you, but maybe it's a difficult conversation that you need to have with someone. Maybe you need to take a very, very difficult step to address something that's been living rent-free in your head. Because here's the thing, whatever that next step is, whatever it looks like to tackle those lies, you then have to replace those lies with the truth. Okay, well, what's what's the truth? I know I have this lie, but how do I find the truth and replace, replace the lie with it? Well, this is going to sound crazy, okay? But stick with me. There is a collection of 66 books. We call it the Bible. And it has a lot of truth in it about ourselves. Here's the thing. I'm not a very good reader. I struggle with readers. Scott, or if God had this sense of humor... He did with me because he turned me into a minister who reads a lot and I'm just not very good at it. I struggle with it. But the thing is, the reps that I've had with scripture, meditating on God's word, it has allowed me to harness his words and to know his truth. But it doesn't happen overnight. You know, you look back at in the book of Psalms that we were in earlier, Psalm 119, 105, the psalmist says that God's word is a lamp unto my feet 
It's a light into my path. It's going to light up the truths that God wants you to have in your mind to know about yourself. Maybe it's that thought that you are helpless and that is living rent-free in your mind. Well, God's word says in 2 Peter that he gives you everything you need to live a godly life. Maybe you're here this morning and you feel unlovable. Well, the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 1 that God made us and he loves us and he chose us in Christ Jesus. Maybe you're here this morning and you struggle with, with feeling worthless, like you're good for nothing. Well, that's a lie because Psalm 139 shares that God actually thinks very highly of you and that he is always with us. Check out this picture. Have you ever driven on a road like that? Yeah. Makes you a little uneasy. It's not the most fun thing to do. Well, those little indentions on the roads, they are called ruts, right? And that happens from a repeated, uh, repetitive things hitting the ground in the same pattern in the same area. And when you go on those ruts and you're driving down the road, they're not, they're not the smoothest thing to ride on, right? Here's the thing. We know what it's like in life to be, to be in those ruts. We focus on those things that live rent-free in our head. Maybe you're here this morning and you're in a rut at school, even though we're about to finish up. You're in a rut at work. You're in a rut and in a relationship. But whatever, whatever that looks like, what if we made it a point to change that pattern? What if we made it a point to change the way that those dominoes fall? What if we, what if we recognize the lies that we have allowed to live rent-free in our minds? And then after we recognize those lies, what if we tackle them? And then we replace those lies with the truth, with what God has to say about you and I. Because I'll tell you this morning, it's better to be in the ruts of life with God than to be on smooth asphalt without him. Let's pray. God, we thank you for, uh, for this day that you've given us. I don't know what's going through everyone's minds this morning. As we've been going through this message, maybe some of us have been reminded of some things that we have living rent-free in our heads. Father, as we leave and depart this place here in a bit, may we be mindful of those things living rent-free. May, may we recognize those lies and manipulative thoughts and, and not just allow them to sit at the table, but what if we take action, help us to tackle those thoughts and replace them with the truth of what you have to say about us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.